Okay, so uh, I think we can start. We're very happy to have uh, Cliff Nick here talking to us about uh, H2O, which I don't know much yet about it, but for, so far it seems to be an amazing framework. So uh, please go ahead. Thank you. It's fast, it's parallel, distributed, always. 
The reads run at the same kind of speeds as the Java rate load. Writes go a little bit slower because you have to do the compression step along the way. But we're using memory bandwidth limited anyhow. And we also limit the entire Java memory model semantics always, even on the distributed cluster. So it's exact semantics. You get more on that in a minute here. So take a quick look at how we distribute the data and then how we distribute the compute. So how does it work data? So the data is kept in vectors, arrays, giant distributed arrays, whose length is longer than what you can have in an int. So the indices are 64 bits. Um, there's an at and a set call to fetch and set data. Um, there's a notion the missing element is an A. That's a data science specific thing. It's not necessarily an engineer's idea, but the mathematicians love it. Um, and of course, you can append the data sets are, are um, a variable size. Uh, you can change things on the fly. In fact, you can do parallel distributed pins, and I'll do order preserving pins as I go. So, show you how that's done at some point here. So, it's a big vector. Um, it's very long, as I mentioned. It's compressed. Um, it's conceptually uh, full of Java primitives, generally uh, double, but it's due to compression, it's not actually implemented or represented in memory as a Java double. There's something else happened with compression. Um, random access is completely supported. Um, however, um, you're guaranteed that if you do strike one linear access through the data set, you'll get memory bandwidth speed. So that's sort of the cost model. And all throughout this talk, I'll, I'll keep mentioning how I'm implementing a cost model. The data is very big, so it's distributed. In this case, I'm showing it split across four JVMs. It's split sort of vertically in this pattern. Um, it's kept in the Java heap, not off heap. The data, we let GC do the right things. Because of the way we structure the data, the standard default old school collector does a very good job. We happily run with 200 gigabyte Java heaps, and they have you know modest one, two second pauses occasionally. Um, 10 gigabyte heaps, I do on my laptop all the time. They're cheap and fast, they just work straight. Um, it's not just one vector, of course, it's a two dimensional table. And going across, there's some collection of, of column types that represent some real world thing that you're trying to track. In this case, maybe I'm collecting information about people who are going to drive cars and how many they have and what age they are and whether they're male or female and things like that. And this is similar to an R data frame for people doing data science. Um, really, the top level frame is simply a collection of pointers that's an array of vectors. And I can add and subtract vectors freely. I can shuffle them and reward them any way I want. That's all cheap and free because it's just a point of change to do that. Um, the vectors are aligned in memory so that when I go across, I don't have to change JVMs to get all the different values in that struct going across with that single observation. And that's key because it lets me have a known cost model for visiting all the columns of any particular observation. Within a column, the data is chunked. Uh, chunk is typically a thousand to a million elements in length. It's a unit of my compression strategy. There's about 20 different compression strategies in, in use here. Um, we'll take a look at that chunk of data and think of an appropriate compression strategy. Um, the, the strategy lets me do a, a get or an add or a set in a few clock cycles. So the guarantee is I can always pull the data out in a handful of clock cycles and get the real value. Um, and that's key because I'm going to pull it in memory through the cache hierarchy in the CPU register, still compress. I'm going to decompress it just exactly when I use it, use it, and then throw it away. I'll never store the decompressed version anytime in memory or in caches. It's only, it's only in the registers. And that's because the compression saves me on memory bandwidth, and that is in fact typically the bottleneck that we have running with the big data. So we can actually outrun, say, blobs regimes who are storing full width doubles if the data set happens to represent small ints or Boolean values that are showing up as a bit vector because we'll just compress and we'll let them in again. Um, okay, I think I mentioned this already. Within a collection of chunks like that, all the, the uh, items are all accessible in the same JVM heap, and they're typically accessed by a single CPU as a single thread operation on that row. The, the, Core that's doing the work can read and write these things in any order. Um, they're all mutable, it's full Java speed um, all the way down the line. And of course, this is my unit of parallel execution. One core will grab a chunk of rows and do a pile of work with it. And that's a big enough piece of work that it covers the overhead costs of launching a fork join task, of launching a thread as needed. Um, but it's small enough I get good fine grained data parallelism. So, so that the uh, 
the sort of standard thing is you'll have several hundred chunks to maybe a million chunks on a node, and you get quite good data, uh, data fine grained parallelism out of that way. And then um, the code that gets written is this very simple MapReduce stuff I'll show you in a minute. But of course, it's not just one core. All the cores light up and grab and go all at once. So sort of a typical operation is we fire up some job, all the cores jump on the data, they all make a big parallel sweep through it. Um, fork join is handling the load balancing within the uh, system. H2O is handling load balancing across systems. Um, it handles all the communication and the data management issues that come with that. And the end result is you get some computation done uh, you know, at, at memory bandwidth speeds, uh, you know, many, many gigabytes a second kind of rates. So this is taxonomy, um, a frame which is a, a, a top-level, two-dimensional structure that you can freely add, subtract, and organize vectors. Vectors are, uh, you know, metadata terms of a collection of chunks of data. The vector spans JVMs, it's distributed. Whereas a chunk is not, a chunk is within one JVMP. Um, the chunk's collection of maybe a thousand to a million elements kind of varies. Each element is conceptually a job to double, but how it's actually represented in memory varies from the compression strategy. And then if you go across instead of down, it's a row. And it's just all the elements. So, so that's the way to think about how the data is presented. It's the programmer's model for looking at the data. So let me talk about how we run through run through the, the data with code, and then we'll look at some of the code examples here. So the, the standard workhorse, it's not the only way to do parallelism, but the most common one is this map reduce paradigm. It's a map from type A to type B, where the type A is typically your big data input. Millions, billions, trillions of rows of data. And your output is either big data or a small data, Ojo being plain old Java object for the non-Java programmers. Um, it's just a struct. Um, and you can have both your big and small outputs. And then the reduction is you're going to take two type Bs and reduce them together. It's a standard aggregate pull up summing kind of thing. Um, the, the general programming paradigm then is you extend an instance of map reduce task, override the map reduce call with your own flavored flavors. Um, you make a new instance of this thing, say do all, and you get your result right back in the instance you just made. And so let's go look at that example. So here we have an 8 node cluster. Um, I'm going to say new Mr. Task at the top, do all data. Um, at the time I say new, some JVM who's running the show here uh, has an instance of a Java object. In blue in the lower left there. When he starts executing the do all, he says, wait a second, I got a job on all this data. I don't have it all local. I need to send the code to the data. So he makes a copy in a logarithmic tree fan out, hands a copy to his two friends who hand a copy to their two friends until everyone has a copy of it. So logarithmic to the death of the cluster, everyone gets a copy of the top level uh, instance of the Mr. Task object, which carries your code. Within a single node, then, we switch over to using Dudley's fork join, which is a classic divide and conquer type of approach. Um, top level task says, I have all this data on this node. It's more chunks than I, I have uh, tasks available. So I'll go ahead and clone myself and say, you're responsible for the other half. And we keep doing the divide and conquer until we have a separate task for every uh, chunk of data in the node. And once that happens, we start executing. And the execution is whatever that map call does, it converts that task object to the B flavor, gives you the output result for just that chunk of data. And once that's done with all the chunks, actually, pair by pair, as the maps get done, reductions happen. So we don't do all the maps followed by the reduction, which is common in the Hadoop world. Every time two maps are done, immediately a reduction happens. When other two maps are done, reduction, and then reduce again, and so on. So the reductions are eager and happen on the fly as you roll through until you end up with the reduced result in some top level instance on a node. And then you go back and do the reductions back up to the log tree in reverse, where people at the leaves have computed a result, they send it back over the wire to their parent in the tree um, who does a reduction, and then the reductions roll up the tree uh, node by node until the last reduction, which is the final result in the top level, and that's the output. That new Mr. Task.doall um, can launch, go through the cluster, and come back 
typically in 10 to 100 milliseconds, like really fast. So if you have more data and fewer cores, it's going to take longer. You know, kind of depends on your ratios. But if you're looking at uh, uh, you know gigabytes of data, you can expect this to be done in low millisecond counts. So you know, variations will depend on your, your speed of your network and things like that, but it's not, it's, it's a really fast operation. Okay, so let's look at kinds of things we can do with the MapReduce, just a quick flavor, um, because it is such a workhorse in the system. So here is a, a, an example from linear regression, just to be some of the squares here, it's really easy, right? So the type A here is a double, type B is also a double, they don't have to be the same, in this case they are. And uh, you know, the map is just square it, and the reduction is just add the, the, the two type Bs and return a type B. And I, I can write these five lines of code, and I'll, I'll get something that will run at memory bandwidth speeds across a terabyte, and just, just like that. So I can have a more complicated operation. Here I've got a set of fields I want to do, and compute a bunch of sums and sums of squares. Um, in this case, my type A is the pair X and Y. My type B is the disk pointer of the Java object, the linear regression passing to one. And that's kind of key because that, that this pointer can get pretty darn complicated and hold lots and lots of interesting stuff. And it, uh, as an efficiency hack, I asked the programmers to write a for loop over an array. In this case, the chunk is your array. And you write a for loop over a chunk of data. So here, instead of being an x, y, I have a chunk of x and a chunk of y. And these are carefully aligned, so they're all the same length, and they're all the same JVM, and they're all next to each other. Um, and then there's a simple for loop. Then there's a chunk at, and chunk y at, chunk x at. That's the decompression step. Same semantics as an array load. Better than the who typically does some sort of bit extract or a shift scale add. Something to be done a couple clock cycles to decompress. Then you have the rest of your math as before. That model right there is the standard workhorse for doing all kinds of stuff. So here's an example of doing a filter. I'm just going to find all the people who pass my filter. All the young male drivers in my data set, because these are the people I'm going to you know, have insurance issues and access issues with. So I just have some simple tests, and I, and I got some interesting uh, collection of people pass the filter. I can accumulate them. I can write the people who pass that filter by appending them into an empty set. So at the bottom, I make a new empty minimal vec. I call my do all on this filter object. And what I get back is uh, a big data output set, which might be much bigger than fits in one node. If I start with a trillion and I have a 99% filter, I end up with something on the a trillion still. So it's just like a fit in one node. So the output is distributed as well. It's kept order and executed entirely in parallel while you're keeping order. But you end up with a distributed set that you can now go on to your next step with, however you, your filter is doing it. Um, this example is simply going to do, uh, show you what it means to write single threaded code that, that is going to do something more interesting. Um, I have some array that's going to collect people on doing histogram. Um, in the map call, I said new. Make me a new long two-dimensional array of longs. I make an array in a map call. Well, how many maps do I run? Okay, well, I run maybe 100, maybe 1,000, maybe a million on a single node. I've got 10, 100, 1,000 of these car ages arrays floating around. Now, it's private to this map, because it said do write a map call. So that plus plus operator, that doesn't have to be atomic. That's a standard non-atomic x86 add one memory operator. So because it's not atomic, it's not very safe. But it's single threaded code, because it's on a private data set. It doesn't have to be very safe. So this is just standard single threaded code. And I end up with a distributed set of my car ages arrays. So because they're one for map, I do have to do the reduction now. And that's where you get uh, uh, the, the concurrent sums happening back in here. Um, I have utilities to help with that. That's just the standard Saxby Daxby style with their walkthrough arrays. And they add them element by element. All the concurrency controls handled by each row uh, and for join. And you don't have to think about it at all. So here's one that's a little bit different. This is going to find uniques of a data set that's distributed. Um, here I'm saying new in the constructor instead of new in the map call. And that means that I'm going to have uh, an object which is uh, initialized with the counter I said new and pass on the cluster for everyone to look at. Um, the map itself adds in parallel to the same instance of the hash set 
uh, as every other map on the same node. So there's one of these hash sets per node, not one per map. So the maps are all sharing. So that hash set has to be concurrent safe. So I pick non black hash set to be concurrent safe. Um, however, it's not that reduction here um, because I do have separate nodes that are accumulating results. So there's a map that's on one node is collected by your uniques, and a reduction is bringing them together as they cross the wire and roll that log tree. And then, you know, whatever, six or seven lines of code, I found uniques across a cluster set. Um, oh, okay, I just popped through this already. Um, because it's in the init call, it's typically an input only field and shared. This one's written, so it has to be reduced and has to be converted. Okay, let's talk about the limitations here. The code is going to run distributed, which means you can't really do any resource machine resource allocation or I/O because you know the system out print line is going to appear on one node and not on everything or not on the cluster as a notion. Right? No new threads, no locks, no system exit. Um, no global or static variables because they don't become cluster global. They say there's no globals. Um, and so instead, there's other ways to think about global data. Small global data that you want to read, you just put it in your constructor, that will be shallow copy around the cluster for everyone to read and use. Small global writable state has to be done through the reduction mechanism. You have to have some way to say, I've written something, piece of here, some piece of there, I have to fold these together, and that's the reduction for it. The big state goes into the read and write world distributed effects. So you, you can have output as either small or large, uh, and, and you handle it a little bit differently. Um, and then the whole notion of the map reducing is you make a pass over the data and get some result back, and you make another pass and another path. It's called both synchronous parallels of the coding paradigm here. The strengths of this thing are interesting though. The code runs distributed in parallel essentially without effort. Millions and billions, trillions of rows, thousands of cores. You write in a single threaded coding style. There's no concurrency issues. There's no knobs needed for the GC or the CPUs or network. You get really good data placement. You get really good load balancing of cores and CPUs and the like. There's no hot blocks, no hot blocks. Here's an example of K-means. So it's an eye chart. It's a hope nobody can read it. Um, but somewhere buried in there, there's a constructor filling in some fields, there's some input outputs, there's a reduction call that's doing the radials add on all kinds of arrays. There's a map call which starts with new, 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 a bunch of arrays. There's a giant for loop that's finding nearest members of the cluster and doing all kinds of math on it. And the, really the takeaway here is that in the system there's 250 or more instances of Mr. Task with tens of thousands of lines of code. It's mathematicians writing math. And H2O running at a scale. So I'm the tool guy. I'm making a platform that is being used by mathematicians all over the world to write interesting high and high level math and have it run at a scale. So this is like, you know, there's something doing going right here that people can sit down and write so much lines of code and have it be paralyzable and do so, so much good stuff with it. Okay. So let's take a look at the block architecture. Um, I'm going to break it down a little bit. There's, uh, I guess it's purple now. Um, it's red on my screen. Um, there's a cluster building block in the lower right, which is sort of the base core and JVMs. There's a notion of big data. There's some big code. And then the, the side in blue, there's uh, external clients. And I'll break it down each one of these in turn. At the base layer, we have an H2O node object, which is a proxy for local resources, your CPUs, your memory, your disk. There's a serialization layer, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, there's none of these fork joints, a fabulous, very lightweight uh, mechanism for handling very fine grained uh, uh, computations on a node. Um, Auto buffer does all things I.O. In particular, it transparently flips between TCP and UDP communications as according to the size of the data structure being passed around. Um, or it does disk I.O. and or even I.O. style channel. Um, there's a reliable uh, remote procedure call layer. Um, it's reliable because we use UDP. But it has to be reliable anyhow because we can make TCP fail because we can trigger a Linux distributed dial service attack and have TCP drop connections on us. We have to have a, a, a reliable RPC for TCP connection, which means you can pull a cable on a cluster and wait five minutes and plug back in and it all just work. Um, keys and values goes into the key store. I'll talk 
about that, about that a bunch more. Um, but these are, are where we're holding on to the big data and serialized dot objects for all kinds of uh, uh, things. So, so I mentioned the serializer, so the Reaper, um, you know, yet another job serializer, really. Um, if you go look on the web, you can find all kinds of uh, studies on speed and performance and the issues about different kinds of serializers. This one handles cycle-free data only. The schema is unknown in advance. The first time we see something we have to serialize we haven't seen before, there's a code generator for it, and there's a, a handshake around the cluster to describe the schema for that particular class. And then thereafter, there's a tiny uh, type ID used to identify a class and all future communications on the cluster. So what really happens is that after that first hit, you know, the, 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 the overhead comes down to two bytes, to, and then the object is streamed out uh, immediately thereafter. There's a lot of compression going on, especially on large arrays. It's very common for people to oversize arrays because they don't know how much they to hold it there, and the tail half is all null, so there's some prefix that's full. And it turns out that you might get suffixes null. And it turns out that the array might be full of, might be defined as long, but full of values that aren't very big. So there's a lot of ways you can compress the data. Um, we're fast with this compression as well because of the code gen involved. It's literally read a field, write a byte into a NIO network buffer. It's entirely memory bandwidth bound. I've looked at the numbers, we're easily 10x faster than the fastest other serializers I can find out there. Um, it, it, it's like stupidly fast, um, given the limits of cycle free data. Um, okay, let's look at the, the yellow stuff. There's a distributed key value store built off the values in the remote procedure call. I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, it's pretty exciting though because it gives you the job memory model with exact consistency and speed. It's fully caching always. Caching, caching gets are about 150 nanoseconds. It's the lookup and hash table, and that's it. You're done. <clears throat> um, puts can stream at ne network bandwidth as opposed to network latency and still preserve the exact uh, consistency semantics. There's transaction support as well. Um, built over that, we take the uh, values, some of which are holding all kinds of exciting things you're building, but some of which hold big data. So the chunks live as a value object, um, including all the compression on chunking, and then collections of chunks make a vector and frames of both the value measure and shoot big data. So back to my architecture slide, the, um, the green stuff. This is distributed fork join, which at its base layer starts with uh, uh, Douglas fork join, uses a reliable remote procedure call to distribute code around the cluster. Um, and from there, uh, we build up the MapReduce work parts. So, so MapReduce is not the only programming paradigm we do, but it's by far the most common one. And then from there, we build up the algorithms, the, the sort of the star of the show, deep learning, neural nets, uh, and random forest, great use of method, generalized logistic uh, linear modeling, which would be logistic regression is the main use of that. Um, all kinds of exciting algorithms are built up there based on that proportion. On the external client side of things here, there's a web server built in. Um, has a, a well-defined, well-spec API for doing all kinds of machine learning and data lunging tasks. Um, built in there as well is a thing we call Rapids, which is essentially a list evaluator, um, which will encode in the URLs uh, and, and include its fully first-class functional. You can do any of the functions, and in particular, you can pass it with maps of the big data. Um, and that feeds into the R and Python clients so you can sit down at your standard R session or your standard Python session and write some Python code that would do something sensible in Python and then just you know, flip the data set to be an H2O frame instead of a standard Python object and instead now it's a cluster. And it, what you might be doing in gigabytes on your laptop in Python, you go to terabytes to cluster sort of fairly directly. Um, the R integration is actually substantially higher. It's almost drop in and go of code that's running in your R client will just up and run on the H2O cluster. There's a, a web interface called Flow, um, which is uh, got a really nice GUI uh, interface for people who are, are wanting to click through machine learning tasks without having to learn how to program R or Python. It's an interesting audience that likes to do that kind of stuff. 
So that's a top level H2O architecture, and I've talked fast for three minutes. So I'm going to I'm going to stop for a second and and see if people are comfortable where we're at, and then I'm going to look at a, a deeper dive in distributed key value score. So this is like if you space a question right now of what we've seen so far, this is a good time to go ask it. Yeah, the microphone's coming. I ain't surprised the microphone guy. <laughs> oh, we be. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay. If you shout it, I'll repeat this question, but maybe another one after it. So we Okay. So so we distribute the data across the cluster. What happens if you lose another? And the answer is, we decided to not mess with the HA, high availability. We started out that way. Um, that market is well served by many people. Um, we're not an HA cluster, we're a giant calculator. So if you lose a node, you lose the cluster. That said, I can reboot a cluster in seconds. And uh, the data load times are almost always this bandwidth bound. We can totally eat whatever your disk size is. All spindles will light up and we'll suck the data in parallel on, on a Hadoop cluster or S3 or anything like that. So that, that 7 terabyte data set I loaded in, that took a couple minutes on S3. So it's, it's fast. Okay, thank you. Uh, I know there's not a lot of people, but I want to do one on one. Your greedy reduction uh, algorithm, uh, does that pose any problems for the types of aggregations you can do? Say that again, I didn't catch it all up. You're using greedy uh, reduction, so as soon yes. as there is a map set you can use, but that poses some limitations on the kind of aggregations you can Does it not? Um, so it, it does. Um, the aggregations have to be, um, well, it does, but it's not as only as you might think. That the reductions are actually almost, they're done in order. The order of the maps is statistically through the code in, in linear order, so the reductions are actually truly ordered. Um, uh, so in that sense, it's as if you did reductions one after another, and in practice, they are almost always executed in order. And sometimes you do get out of order, and then you'll have some reductions wait until the appropriate map finishes. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I had a glimpse about uh, uh, data mining algorithms uh, in your slide, and uh, I was thinking about uh, uh, these algorithms must be aware of the structure of HU2O, or uh, can be reused libraries written in Java, like for example, Wake and stuff. Okay, so um, the algorithms we're using are all written uh, uh, knowing about H2O. So internally, the implementations for like, you know, deep learning and the like, that knows how to say at and set, instead of using some sort of array syntax. Um, it, it uses the limitations that are built into the model, so in particular, I, I'm not taking somebody else's writing code and make it run and distribute it. Um, I don't take Fortran libraries and distribute them and have them run in parallel and do that kind of thing. So it really, um, they're from scratch implementations. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not seeing them right now, so I'm going to roll on. Yeah. And then, and then uh, we'll have another QA session here at the end. OK, so, so I have a KB store. It has some interesting properties. Um, we use it for doing the obvious cross-node communication, where you're going to put the key and the value in one node, and some other node, you're going to say, get a load of key, and you'll get a value. And I'm going to follow the Java memory model. Um, and the keys are used externally to point to data sets and models and results. If you're saying in Python, I'll have some data set, I'll have given a name. And that'll be the name that's being used in the cluster to go on to that data set, even if it's distributed around the cluster. Maybe some models that go. There's all kinds of temporary results being made. Um, internally, every kind of 
temporary data set structure, all kinds of control logic, as well as the big data going to the, the key value score. So it's a heavily used key value score. It's a hardware style cache coherency protocol. Um, every, everything can be cached locally. Uh, caching gets taking, as I mentioned, about 150 nanoseconds to do a hash table lookup. Um, puts to different keys can overlap. Uh, and, and in particular, it's a very common case of our mighty love attempts that I'm going to flood the system with writes to unrelated keys because I'm filling in all chunks of a large temporary vector. Uh, and those can all completely overlap and still follow the Java memory model or not according to whether I want to be volatile or non-volatile access. Um, puts always do network bandwidth limitations, it's not latency. I don't have to wait for some sort of act back to say that the receiver got it. I can just fire and forget the data and, and the act will come back later. Um, locally a put, same as a cache hit, it's 150 nanoseconds of unputting data that's going to be home from the local node. The one restriction here is puts to the same key from the same node half the order, and that turns into a network latency issue. I can't send the next write to the same key from the same node until I get a reply back that I've got right the first one I settled out. Um, keys are randomly placed on a cluster or pseudo randomly placed, which gives me good average behavior. I don't get hot block kind of issues, um, except locally, individually, onesies and twosies. You don't get a, a whole section of hot issues. Um, okay, so I mentioned that. Keys have a home node, they're super, super randomly placed. Um, the, the system itself is fully peer to peer. There's no master anywhere. I think there's no master for the keys. Um, but I can look at a key by inspection, by the hash function, and know where its home is. The home is responsible for breaking ties on racing rights. And it does uh, atomically execute transactions. Um, and it's the ultimate truth for gets. And that's really the only purpose home has. It's not doing any other, it's not doing any sort of other delegation going on. Values, however, do track concurrency, uh, coherency, sorry. The values have uh, uh, a set of what other nodes are sharing a value, have a copy of it. And when the value changes, that list of who else has a copy is used to issue, uh, invalidates. This is very similar to a distributed cache currency protocol in a hardware cluster. Um, and that's will also force right ordering from uh, same key, same node to, to the home for that guy. Um, and so to make it work, values hold a reader writer block. It's a simple, small counter that has to be constantly up and down. Um, it's the count of outstanding gets. I'll show you an example here in a minute. Or there's a put in progress, and this value is about to be replaced with a new value. And it also has a concurrent bit set of what nodes are being cached. OK, so let's go look at an example here. And then I'm going to claim I'm out of waste and out of time. So uh, imagine I have a four-node cluster holding a single key, K1, node A is holding some value, V1, and it's quiescent, there's no gets in flight, so you can't hardly see it. But node A has value 1 and a zero count of gets in flight, and it's caching on node A, that's the little syntax that here is. It's actually a four-node cluster, the other nodes hold anything yet in this little example. So now I'm going to do this inside the pie chart. Node B does it get, and he wants to get a copy of it. So he fires off a request because it's not in his local cache. So A says it gets in progress and raises his count by one. He adds B to the list of people caching it. He sends back B1 to B, who puts it in his local KD store, and the act acts back. But as soon as he gets a copy, he can continue execution, the act act goes in the background. The act act comes back, lowers the count of uh, gets in progress to zero, and B now has a copy of the thing on the A. If C and D do the same thing, the same thing happens, although they're all overlapping in this example. C requests, key requests, the count goes up, the cache gets bigger, results come back, results come back, uh, and then the hack acts on one account. Um, at this point, at the end of here, everyone has a copy that's fully cached. Everyone can just grab the copy at a, you know, the standard cache and look up cost. Uh, you don't have to wait for the hack acts to complete, you just have to get your data and you're good to go. So given the fully Cache the situation here, what happens in some issues with rights? But okay, now it gets complicated. So welcome to the cache currency protocols 101. <laughs> no C's doing a write, a put, a value 2, replace value 1. So the cache of the put is a local update. Um, so he just updates itself locally immediately, and that is valid in the Java semantic model. But he sends the, the, the update to the home node for, 
for key one, which is A. And so A ends up having to do an atomic update to replace value two for value one. There might be racing threads who are still finding value one at this point. So the put isn't yet atomically available, not, not completed. Um, A then locks value one, saying no more nodes can cache it. And at that point, he knows that only B and D have copies of it. Uh, and he needs to go clean them out and validate them. So he begins initially and validates the e, e. When those acts comes back from the validates, he knows that no one else in the cluster has a copy of the old value one. At that point, the value two is now semantically available for everyone. The, the put has completed. This is the visibility of only find value two at this point. So he then sends his act back to C. So C knows it. And at this point, C has the semantic equivalent of a volatile store as happening. And at this point, C can carry on with other operations going full well. If anyone asks for the K1, they'll get the value of C just wrote. In particular, it means that C can update something that he wants other people to see and update a pointer to it. It's two separate steps. And if somebody fetches the pointer that C wrote, they will guarantee fetch the value that went before it. It's a standard happens before relationship you have to have Java volatiles. Um, and then you, you get it using the protocol this way. Ah, I slide out, dang it. Okay, so let me go back to the slide here real quick. So, so key things to look at this are parallel bulk reads always cache locally and have no other coherency. And once the value's been cached locally, it costs you nothing to read your value again from the cache. Parallel bulk writes go at network bandwidth rates, not network latency rates. You can stream them out in parallel across the network. It's the only back-to-back -back gets and puts in the same key that starts seeing the invalidates and have to take weights and gets. And only if you care about the ordering, if only you're doing volatile stop puts, you need to have that level of order. So the, the, the major operations that we see being done in the cluster always go as the maximum possible speed allowed uh, by the hardware in question. There are only a handful of cases where we actually see the, the invalidates causing things to slow down. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, what is H2O? It's clustered memory computing. It's clustered data, column or compressed. It's fine grained data parallelism um, via MapReduce, where you write single threaded code and have it run parallel distributed like really well. Um, it's a high speed, exact consistency Java memory model to help developers write all kinds of exciting code. Um, highly integrated into R, Python, Scala, Spark, Java, web interface. Um, you know, it's best for using machine learning algorithms, not distributed. It's like a real tool builder's delight platform to mess with. So, you know, we're making math scale. If you're interested in working on H2O, you can go to this website or poke us in general at the, you know, H2O the support email, and somebody will talk to you about what kind of stuff's going on and what they're looking for. So that's it. Thank you. So if there are questions, please raise your hand, please. Two questions. The first one really quick. Which JVM do you use? If you use Hotspot or some more exotic JVM like Zing, they know very well. We run on Hotspot, standard, Java 6, 7, 8. Okay. And the second question is, uh, H2O, H2O is, uh, does MapReduce very fast? And you mentioned in the limitation that not all problems are suitable for MapReduce, you mentioned BSP, and I wanted to ask you if this was a decision that you made after looking at all, uh, let's say, economical problems that people run and say, okay, MapReduce is what people need and I'm going to focus on that because other problems are not probably ready. Right, so we stared at, at the different kinds of programming paradigms of the models. Um, but we also looked at, at sort of the business proposition here. And we started out life as a, as a 
high performance key value store with HA and replication and all that kind of stuff. And that market's well served. And, and after like six months in, we pivoted to doing machine learning, which then got us into looking at big data. So then we suddenly have a realm of uh, uh, square data, two dimensional big tables, and obvious data parallelism. So at that point, while there are a number of programs that work on that, MapReduce works, it is a particularly easy to code to. So what we wanted was a programming paradox, which is uh, there's a fact that we did that, so you know, we'll just start with the end of the thing. So the, what we wanted was a paradigm that we could guarantee new performance in, which is also easy to use. So we had this tension between it's easy enough to write code in, but the code can write cool and fast. Right? And so, so it's no good to have giant data and code run slow, you're just here to get it. So I've got a trillion rows, I'm writing a for loop, I'm writing just one of the trillion, it's not ready to get done. So it has to be paralyzable, it has to be easy to write to, and then the map can just sort of fit that bill. Now, having said that, that's not the only paradigm that we use internally, there are good others. That is by far the larger work. What license uh, is your code? Apache V2. Thank you. Other questions? How do I store the data? Uh, so the Just one over that. Go back.